fermentation was an art, not a science, but we're going to learn more about the science. Take it away, Stuart. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. It's day three. No, people are dragging, <laughs> much like I am. So thanks for coming. Uh, I see some. Uh, well, can, I, can everybody hear me, by the way, or do you, do you need me to speak into the microphone? I uh, I tend to walk around a little bit. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, so uh, I see some friendly faces out there, which is nice. I see some former students who probably were hoping they'd never have to hear me speak again, but uh, that's that's not going to happen. So get ready. Uh, all right, um, we already talked about, uh, the, the talk was introduced, um, I mean, what is this one uh, So the talk was already introduced, that's the title, Taking Your Lab to the Next Level. Um, let me go ahead and advance to the next slide so that I can just quickly give you talk goal here. Um, hopefully this won't be me just standing up here spewing things. Uh, my, my whole goal here is to try to spark it, an open discussion, so uh, hopefully you guys will get involved. At any point, stop me if you have questions. Uh, chime in, even if it's not a question, you can chime in and, and, uh, and add to the conversation. I'm not going to stand up here and say that I'm the expert in all of these topics. What I'm going to do is introduce you to some topics, some of which I'm, I'm ex have some expertise and, and experience in. Uh, but many of you in the audience are going to have more uh, more knowledge and expertise in some of these areas than I do. So chime in. Uh, let's have a open discussion and talk about some of these things. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about are directly lab related. So there might be equipment that's going to be that you could you could purchase or use in your lab. But a lot of these things are just going to be general quality ideas. So things that you might not have thought about or uh, might be a refresher that you haven't thought about in a while if you have already thought about them. Things that uh, are just th uh, tidbits that I'm putting out there that can hopefully increase beer quality and consistency across the board. And I think that's a goal that probably everybody in this room has or should have. So, uh, so anyway, interrupt at any point and, um, and chime in as well. All right, so here is just a really broad outline of what I'm going to talk about today. And this is just the way that I kind of break down uh, how I think about quality as far as brewing goes. <clears throat> there are a lot of different areas you can focus on. You can go down any of these paths. You can go down all of these paths. As you're starting out with your lab, you have to kind of choose a direction and there are a number of different directions you can go down. This is kind of the way that I like to split it up. So first I'm gonna talk about some aspects of biology. Uh, so if you wanna focus on more biological side of things, I'll talk about some things there. Next I'll get into a little bit more on the chemistry side. So there's a lot of chemistry that goes along with beer, that's all of you know. And there are different avenues you can take as far as, as uh, chemical components go. Third, I say physics here, it's more physical testing, things like carbonation, um, it's just the way that I split it up, so I'll talk about that uh, as a third topic. Fourth, sensory program, sensory program's important, very important, it's another avenue that you can go down, so we'll touch on that some. And then fifth is just kind of a, um, something I, I like to stick in at the end, which is uh, communication and education, I'll talk a little bit about that, just the fact of getting uh, some of your staff trained as far as uh, what to look for, how to interact with the public, that kind of thing, um, can also help with your quality and consistency as far as your message goes for your brewery. So we'll end on that. So we'll talk about biology first. That was the first component that I had on that previous slide. Uh, micro program is always a good avenue to go down as far as your lab goes. And there's a lot of different areas in the brewery, a number of critical stages at which you can do testing. And there are different things that you test for at those different, different stages. So 
you can test every batch for microbes at, at all these stages. Brew house obviously is going to have different components, different things you're going to test for. You're going to test for more things like wort spoilers rather than things that can actually spoil beer once there's alcohol in there. Um, testing in the fermenter, like I just said. So you're going to uh, test for different things in the fermenter than you might test for in the brew house. In between those two, I put in parentheses heat exchanger, and that's kind of my internal reminder to, to say that in my experience, the heat exchanger is one of the most notorious places for trapping microbes. Um, if you're not testing your heat exchanger or breaking it down on a fairly regular basis to make sure there's not stuff growing in there, you might want to think about it. Uh, just in my experience, it's, it's uh, one of the critical places that tends to trap a lot of things. Um, Obviously then from fermenter on to finishing tank, so you're going to look for different things, uh, especially once you clear the beer, if you do filter or, or centrifuge, uh, you're going to have a different, different balance of things you're going to look for. And then finally, of course, packaged product, you want to make sure that what you have on the shelf as you store it is it going to do things that you don't want it to do. So you don't want to have microbes in there that are going to that can, uh, come alive, either cause excess carbonation or change the flavor of the product. Or souring goes, or or, um, or changing other flavor components. But these are all avenues of which you can do you can do micro testing. <coughs> so as far as what kind of microbes you're going to monitor, again, I said at different stages you're going to monitor for different things. Um, so that's why I kind of split wort and beer spoilers. So those are different things. So wort spoilers, things that can grow in sugar. In an aerobic environment are, are th some things you can test for, but that's completely different than what beer spoilers are. They can grow in an anaerobic environment with alcohol present. Um, so you can kind of differentiate between those two things if you want to test those. Uh, it's a good idea to make sure your, your brewing yeast is pure if you're using a pure culture. Even if you're using mixed cultures, you want to make sure that you have control over that. So you want to know what you have in there. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not you don't have contamination with, uh, with things that you, you don't want to have. Um, and then of course, if you're doing any kind of bottle conditioning or can conditioning, you want to make sure that that strain that you use is, is pure. So you want to make sure that, that what you use in there is, is what you intended. But you also want to make sure that you know what it's going to do, what that strain does in the product that you're going to condition. So you want to know where that's going to finish, that way you don't have overcarbonation. Um, you you want to make sure that you have all of that ironed out before you start start to get in that that path, just because it can be a, a dangerous situation and it can ruin your brand if you have things that are going to be overcarbonated or or um, exploding uh, or changing flavor too. So, just an important thing to to note. I don't I don't think I'm introducing necessarily any new concepts, but things to remember as you as you move on and start to try some different things. So down at the bottom, obviously, these are the, some of the big organisms that people look for. There are many more of these, more than just listed here. So this isn't an all exhausted, exhausted list, but um, of course, things like lactopedio, we hear, hear a lot about, um, but wild yeasts, uh, especially as a lot more people have moved into doing wild fermentations, you know, uh, Kind of getting a handle on what those do in your product and, and um, how how they behave uh, is, is obviously important. So some ways that you can do this testing. Again, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, uh, but we can talk talk more about it if you guys want to want to interrupt. But things like this the media that just means different types of, of media where you can grow all these different uh, samples from all these different critical stages to try to really tease out what's in there. Um, so, you know, brewing strains are going to grow on different media. You can use inhibitors in that media to, to, to inhibit your brewing strain and try to see what else might be in there. Um, wild yeast grow on certain media that, that brewing strains can't grow on. Uh, it all depends on what strain you're using, though. Because some strains, some brewing strains, true brewing strains, can grow on some of these media. It all depends on what your strain is, and it's just important for you to get to know 
what strains, uh, how your strains that you're using behave in all, in all these different cases. Um, Bacteria, obviously there are media that grow bacteria. Uh, there are media that grow different types of bacteria, so you can kind of use selective media to, to determine what you might have in there and, and really get a handle on how pure your strains are, but also if you're testing samples throughout the brewery, find out what's truly in there. Um, and there are a lot of guides and, and um, there's a lot of expertise as far as micro, um, microbiological testing on the, on the internet, on the, web, on the web, you can find a lot of this information. Uh, really old technique that a lot of people use, I'm sure you've heard of it, is gram staining. That can help you to differentiate. If you do find some bacteria, you can determine whether or not it might be something that's actually going to spoil your beer or not. Um, it's a really easy technique. It will require you to have a microscope, though. Um, so that's another avenue, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, some, of these, some of these tests will require you to get a microscope. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, Obviously, if you're looking for something that can grow in an aerobic environment versus something that can grow in an anaerobic environment like, like beer, like carbonated beer, uh, you're going to want to be able to incubate those separately. There are ways you can do that on a simple basis too, um, but it's something to determine really whether or not you have something that can spoil your beer versus something that can spoil wort or um, might infect a, a, a cask or something that has a little more exposure to oxygen. Uh, one way a lot of people get around uh, to try to, to try to test for any kind of microbe really at all uh, is ATP monitoring. I'm sure a lot of you have this kind of monitoring or at least have heard about this. There are a lot of companies now that offer this kind of, uh, of monitoring. It really is just testing for ATP. So it's testing for any kind of, uh, basically any organism. Um, I just listed a few companies. There are many more. If you do a search for, for ATP monitoring. Typically the way it's done is they have some kind of swab. There are, are a number of different ways it can be done, but uh, they'll have a swab that you, that you can use to swab whatever areas you're looking to, to test for. You stick it in the machine and it spits out a number and tells you how, how much, um, how, you know, quantifies how much uh, organism might be, might be there. Um, and, uh, you know, again, there are a lot of different companies and there are, you, can, you can read reviews and talk to your, your fellow brewers about which ones you, which ones they like. And then, of course, if you want to get a little fancier, there are a lot of PCR-based systems. Uh, the advantage of these it, uh, over ATP monitoring is you can actually, a lot of times, get what organism, um, the, the actual species of the organism. Um, so some of these will determine that. Some of them are designed to just broadly detect uh, organisms. Some are designed to actually give you a, a readout of what organism might be in there. Uh, and again, <clears throat> just like for ATP monitoring, there's a lot of different companies now that are doing this. So uh, Invisible Sentinel, for example, uh, Paul has the gene disk. There are a bunch of kits you can get to use with the Light Cycler or the uh, Tyco kits. Um, you could even go old school if you are an old scientist like me and set up your own PCR system using uh, probes to something like rhizomal RNA for different organisms that you're looking to, to analyze. Um, it all depends on how much familiarity you have. Some of these kits obviously make it a lot easier to be able to, to do it because you don't have to have a lot of expertise. You can kind of um, just follow, follow the recipe basically that they, they give you and it'll, it'll still give you good information. But again, a little more cost associated with some of these other things. All right, so moving on from some of the uh, some of the microbes, strict microbe testing. We can also just talk in general about propagating your yeast. And I'm not always just talking about not necessarily just talking about growing your own yeast and not buying it from a company, but rather your practices as far as how you uh, monitor your yeast as you pitch it from tank to tank and, and move it along in your, in your brewery. So I always recommend, I think it's very important if you're not keeping track, always keep track of how many generations your, your yeast uh, is 
what, where you're at as far as how many times you've re-pitched is, is good. Um, so you want to try to track the number of pitches. And really, once you start to do that, you can compare that to how your fermentation is going and really get a handle on uh, what your best practice is for when you want to refresh that culture. So when you want to start over, whether you're starting it over from making it in-house or buying a new culture from a company, um, I just think it's, it's critical to, to track that as you go along. So again, I mentioned on uh, a couple slides ago, in order to do some of this that I'm going to talk about, you probably are going to have to have a microscope. Um, those microscopes aren't necessarily that expensive. Uh, and they come in a number of different forms, a couple of which I, I put up here. Uh, personally, I like to have a binocular microscope, which just means that you've got two eyepieces to look through. You don't have to do that. You can also get, um, get ones that just have a single, uh, single eyepiece to, to look through. It really depends on what you like to, how you like to look at the yeast. Um, I put the one on the bottom in there just to remind myself to give a little uh, mention that now with the advent of how cheap cameras are, you can also get one that either has a third, uh, third eyepiece where you can put a camera on it or a video camera, uh, or sometimes now they have them just with a camera built into the, into the uh, actual manifold above. Um, the only reason I point that out is because it can be useful for uh, showing other people. So if you have a question on a forum, you can upload a picture or you can send somebody a picture and say, hey, here's what it is, here's what it looks like, uh, can you help me? You know, um, and, I, and that's one uh, great thing about the craft brewing community is everyone's really helpful. So uh, that's the only reason why I plug that if you're, if it's something to think about, if you're going to get a microscope, you might want to go down that path. Uh, there are other ways you can take pictures. Obviously, you don't have to do it this way, but I uh, just wanted to mention it. So, what a microscope will allow you to do um, is you can actually look at the cells. So you can do uh, cell counting. You can get a, a hemocytometer and do some yeast cell counting. You can actually look at some of these other microbes, uh, wild yeast, and um, if you get one with enough magnification, you can look pretty in depth at what kind of bacteria you, you, you might have in there. Um, especially if you do like a gram stain, then you can tell color, you can see what you can start to narrow it, narrow it down what organisms you might have in there. So 400x to 1,000x is really what you're going to have. Keep in mind that a lot of times, if you're going to buy a scope, you'll see the objectives listed, which are the things that you rotate around to get different magnification. You have to add that in, multiply that in with whatever your eyepiece magnification is. So a lot of times eyepieces will be 10x magnification or 4x magnification. It just depends on the, on the microscope, but remember that it's a combination of what your eyepiece magnification is also along with what your objectives are. Um, you can get fancy with the microscope. Uh, aside from what I already mentioned, you can also uh, get one that can do polarized light, which will let you uh, even tell a little bit of morphology. Um, aside from having to do staining, you can, you can get around it that way. Uh, you can go with uh, even an automated cell counter there are companies, a lot of companies out there now that are selling automated cell counters if you don't want to do the manual counting yourself. Um, I would encourage you again just to talk to, to talk to people and see what they like, um, see if people have recommendations that are using them. You can also get demos of all these things, so don't hesitate to call a company if you're interested. Even if you think it might be out of your price range, call them, they'll come by and, and you can do a demo and see, see for yourself. Um, sometimes they might drop it off and let you use it for for a while as well, so always something to think about. Does anybody have any questions yet? Yeah. Now, you talk a little bit about um, methods to measure viability. Viability, yeah. Yeah, so um, there are a number of ways, and again, I think, uh, uh, you know, I'll mention a couple things and, and open it up if anybody wants to add. Uh, obviously, there are some some stains you can use. So there's methylene blue staining, there are some stains that um, the idea is that a healthy cell will, uh, won't take the stain up. Um, 
again, it all depends on the stain that you're using. Um, there are there are staining techniques that will allow you to differentiate between cells that either uh, are alive or dead, or don't have might, might not be dead necessarily, but don't have a uh, healthy membrane and intact membrane to be able to to keep uh, these dyes out. And so you can basically just count through through your microscope, you can count uh, how many cells have color, how many don't. Um, in order to get kind of a viability measurement. Uh, I know that there are also fluorescent stains that you can do that, that kind of do the same thing. Um, does anybody want to contribute right now? Um, because I know that there are some, some, you know, I know that people, this is definitely a topic where people have uh, opinions on whether, on what they think they like better and what actually predicts viability more. Does anybody want to chime in? Uh, come on. Yeah. Um, so we use, I do a quick setup, probably only cost about $300 for a microscope, a little bit of methylene blue, and we want to say copper. Yeah. We were checking it every time, using, and we use a lot of dry yeast. So we basically just figured out the weight and had achieved through self counting the, the pitch rates. Right. And made it kind of easy. They were consistent. They were all in, you know, within five percent of the same cell count. Compared to the of years. And now we've kind of gotten down to so we just wait out. So it's quite a bit. It goes a little bit of an initial testing. Not by any means that complicated to do. You get a little thicker thing and just click away at it. And it makes cell count viability relatively easy. And then you correlated that to weight of your slurry? Is that what you're saying? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that we would like a little bit of more off rehydrate. Yeah. And it's the same fish amount for a period at the same time. And they really improved the consistency. Yeah. That was coming out of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, definitely blues, like, it's really easy to use. I've seen inside of uh, several places. So if you're getting viability below 80%, not really a, a not as accurate. Um, yeah. Which you got viability lower than eight percent, probably wrong. Anyway. Right. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. Um, you know, I, I've some some people like it, some people don't. I think it's a really easy way to, to get to get a, a handle on it. But yeah, I think that um, you have to you have to realize at some point that it's probably got limits. Um, anybody else? Um, yeah, so you brought up a good point, um, which I didn't say much about, but there are other ways to determine your yeast pitch consistency other than just cell counting. Um, so if you don't have a microscope, you can do things like a spin down technique where you take a sample of your slurry, you spin it down in a centrifuge. Um, again, you're going to have to have a centrifuge or access to some kind of centrifuge. You can even get a hand crank centrifuge, believe it or not, that are, that are fairly cheap. Um, but you can end up correlating what your solids are uh, in your in your slurry and correlate that to, to uh, what your pitch rate is to try to get a, a handle on uh, pitch consistency. So again, it's uh, kind of a, a, a more higher level or a more general technique. It doesn't go into a lot of depth in actually counting cells. You're really just looking at solids. But find that uh, that works for you, then you can start to correlate how many you know, what your percent solids are and, and be able to get a more consistent, at least a, a decent consistent uh, pitch from batch to batch. All right, uh, so now we'll move on to actually monitoring fermentation. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised by uh, this first bullet point here, which is I think it's important to measure density of all your fermenting beers at least daily, um, mainly just to make sure that your fermentation is still going, to make sure that you're getting the, the amount of gravity decrease that you think you should be getting, um, just to keep a watch on it, just to make sure that something hasn't happened, whether your tank temperature is off or, or you think you might have to pitch more yeast. 
uh, it's a good idea to, to at least keep a watch daily. Um, again, tank temperatures, you want to make sure you calibrate your thermometers. Uh, it seems like a really basic thing, but uh, having a consistent, knowing, knowing that your temperatures are correct and that you, uh, from tank to tank, tank to tank have the same, uh, have consistent tank temperatures, uh, is going to be important for your fermentation. So you want to make sure that you're not fermenting too warm or too cold, mainly for consistency in your beer. Uh, just a, a couple of degrees can make a, a world of difference as far as uh, things like flavor components, but how fast your beer moves, where it's going to end, all that stuff is really important. Um, so you want to watch that. One way that you can do it, I promise you this is my only plug of the talk. Um, this is a company that I work for, Precision Fermentation. You can stop by our booth and find this out, um, booth number 34. But one way you can one possible way you can do uh, do this is by attaching a fermentation monitor that monitors this in real time. So you can see your measurements throughout your fermentation. Um, you don't actually have to go and sample every every day. Um, you can see your gravity and, and a bunch of other parameters that I listed. Dissolved oxygen, pH, pressure. You can see them as the fermentation is going. Um, you still will want to do some micro sampling, of course, the stuff that I talked about at the beginning. This instrument doesn't do that, um, but it's a way to get a good handle on how your fermentations are going and try to benchmark how your fermentations uh, look from either from tank to tank or from uh, one, one route to the, to the next. Uh, again, some of these are just very simple ideas, but um, if you're not going to repitch that yeast, one thing that I've found in my experience that's useful is to post a list, what I call a drop list, you can call it whatever you want, but post a list in the cellar of which tanks need to be, need to have the yeast dropped out. And someone can just check that off whenever they do it. Sometimes it takes as many as three or more drops on successive days to be able to get all that yeast out of there. But if you're not going to reuse that yeast, get it out of the tank. It's very critical to, to, uh, to flavor, maturation, how your beer is going to taste. You don't want that yeast in there hanging around. Once, it, once it's done its job, it's going to start to, de start to decay. And eventually you're going to get cell lysis and all that stuff's going to go into your beer. So, it's just a recommendation that I have is, is to, to put some kind of a drop list in the cellar. It'll also keep you from dropping yeast that you need for your fermentation, or that you might need for your fermentation. Because I know that's happening to me on many occasions. It's time to repitch and someone already got rid of the yeast. So if you have a list that says don't drop or do drop, then uh, obviously, this is a kind of a no-brainer, but once you've reached terminal gravity, you're going to want to crack the tank. But you only want to do that, you only want to chill the tank after you know your bath is gone. So, obvious, but I'm just pointing it out. Um, everybody has tasted beer where there's diacetyl in it. Um, all of us in the industry usually can detect it or know that it's out there. Um, but again, uh, it, it's going to be critical for consistency purposes and for your flavor profiles to not have diacetyl in there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more on, on diacetyl later, uh, but I have this really cute uh, slide that I made up for the Anyway, diacetyl is not good, as you know. So now we're going to move from biology to chemistry. These are just some of the chemistry tests you can do. Again, not an exhaustive list at all, uh, but I kind of hit some of the high points. Again, BDKs, that goes back to the diacetyl that I was just talking about. There are different ways you can test that. You can, you can do just a sensory test, so you can um, heat up a sample and have some trained people smell it, taste it, see if it's in there. That's a simple way to do it. You can also uh, go through to, to having some chemical testing done. So you can do some chemical tests in a lab, uh, it will require you to have some kind of advanced equipment, either a spectrophotometer, which I'll show on the next slide, um, or something something uh, even more advanced. 
um, something like a GC or, uh, or even an HPLC or something like that where you can get um, VDKs. So uh, that's one, one thing. Water monitoring, that falls in the in, in, uh, chemistry group. What does your water look like? Does it fluctuate from day to day? Um, does it, you know, how much chlorine? Does the chlorine change? Uh, do you filter the chlorine out? If you do, uh, you can test it afterwards and you can help determine when your chlorine filter might need to get, might need to get replaced. Um, things like color, if you want to have color consistency, I know some people aren't really worried about it. Um, and color might not matter a whole lot, except it can tell you maybe if something about your raw ingredient changed. So maybe your malt supplier changed something you didn't know about. If your color starts to, ch starts to change, it can be a good indicator that, hey, maybe I need to look at that and see what happened, see if that's changing the flavor as well. Uh, bitterness, obviously, if you're interested in uh, quantifying bitterness, either in your beer or determining alpha and beta acid content of some of your hops, so if you're doing more physical testing on your raw ingredients. I'll touch on that again in a minute. Um, you can do that also. Uh, you might, you, you'll need to have a spec as well, spec number as well. Um, things like acetaldehyde, so off flavors, things that your yeast might be producing or uh, not, not re-consuming in the case of diacetyl. Um, alcohol, obviously, if you want to test for alcohol, there are ways you can do that. Um, things like free amino nitrogen, if you're worried about whether your, your work has uh, proper nutrients, all of those things are avenues that you can go down as far as chemical testing goes. So here's just a couple of stock images. When you're, if you do go down this route and buy a spectrophotometer, it's probably useful to go ahead and get a UV and visible. Uh, visible is the cheapest, but if you can get a UV uh, lamp as well, uh, it's going to help you with being able to do a lot more of the testing than I showed on the previous slide. If you want to get even fancier, I mentioned this earlier, but HPLC or GC, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, these are, you know, you're going to have a little more expense here, but will allow you to do a lot more testing, especially if you want to look more in depth at what your work is composed of. So things like carbohydrates, what amino acids you might have in your work. Uh, you can even look at hop components with an HPLC. Uh, GC is going to be more on the <clears throat> aromatic side, so aromatics, alcohols, flavor compounds, that kind of thing. Um, you can get with the GC. So now we'll move on to physics. So I've covered biology and chemistry somewhat. Now we're going to talk about what I would characterize as physical testing, testing of raw materials, things like your malt, uh, your hops. I already mentioned some of the tests that you can do as far as hops go, um, and, and also covered what you can do as far as testing your yeast to make sure you have pure cultures and make sure there's not anything contaminating there. Um, Carbonation, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Dissolved oxygen as well. I'll cover the rest of these things with, with separate slides uh, that have to do with physical testing. So carbonation first, obviously, no, no one's uh, shocked by this, but a proper level of carbonation inside your package is critical for the customer and retailer experience. If you're um, if someone at the tap room is trying to pour your beer and it's all foam or um, your beer's flat, that's obviously going to impact how that how the customer they're serving it to sees it, but also the retailer themselves might, might get angry because they can't pour your beer properly. So getting a handle on that is, is critical for, for consistency in your, in your brewery, um, even from batch to batch. So you might have the same beer flat one time and well carbonated the next time. Those beers are going to taste very different, so you want to make sure you get a handle on that. There's a lot of different ways you can test carbonation, um, and uh, some are more uh, low-brow methods that are easy and relatively easy to, to put in place. Some obviously you can spend a lot of money as well, um, but just query your community and see who, see, see what people like and, um, and what your budget is. Obviously, will determine what you can, what you, what you want to do. As far as bottle conditioning goes for carbonation, um, so re re-fermentation, if you're going to do any kind of re-fermentation, 
Again, I already touched on this, I'm not going to talk much about it, but make sure you know what yeast you're going to use, uh, know how much you're going to put in there to get the carbonation level that you want, and also uh, as far as haze level goes. Uh, what sugar are you going to use for your bottle conditioning? You need to know what, uh, whether or not the strain you're going to use can eat that sugar, obviously, to turn it into carbonation, but also what, uh, how much sugar to add so that you get the right level of carbonation, how that impacts your flavor profile, all of these things you want to consider as you go down that path. Um, you can get some pressure monitors to ensure that that carbonation level is being reached. And I'll show a picture of that on the next slide. So uh, this is just an example. There's other ones that you can buy. But it just attaches to the top of your bottle. You can get these for cans as well and tell you what your carbonation increase was, just so that you have a good handle on how, um, how much carbonation you're actually putting in when you condition. Alright, so dissolved oxygen is one of the next ones on the list. Obviously, proper oxygenation of the work is crucial for a healthy fermentation, but also consistency in how much oxygen you put in. So getting a handle on how much you're putting in and making that consistent across uh, across your, your brewing process. Uh, it's going to be different for different beers as well, um, and that's just something that if you get a handle on it, you can make it consistent, and it will help you have consistent fermentations. <clears throat> Obviously, in finished beer, it's a different problem, so you don't want to have oxygen in there. You can dramatically shorten your shelf life. I think all of you know that already. Uh, but that oxygen pickup can occur multiple points throughout the manufacturing process. If you have a way of testing for dissolved oxygen, uh, you can start to start to uh, find out where you might be having that oxygen pick up by testing in different places. It's a good good idea to, to get a good handle on when you might be picking up oxygen throughout your process. All right, um, the light testing. Some of these slides I'm going to go through fast um, because I think they're pretty obvious, but I'm pointing them out just so that you. Uh, just so that you keep it in mind, um, obviously you want to check throughout a packaging run. You want to test fill height to make sure they have the right volume. And this is important not only for the customer getting the right volume, but also for audit purposes. So you want to be able to keep track of that as, as you're um, uh, in case, in case you get audited, you want to have a log of that. Um, for an object uh, testing, so these are just some things you can institute in order to detect some foreign objects in here uh, in the, throughout the process. So having a mill magnet might help you get out some of the things that can damage your equipment. Um, if you have a can and bottle rinser, that's going to help you get rid of any kind of dust or uh, other objects that might be in there. Raw cans and bottles. Um, an x-ray uh, machine can tell you if you have any objects uh, in your filled, filled product, packaged product. So on the sensory, um, I already harped on this, I'm not going to talk much more about it, but obviously make sure you have, uh, you're, you're checking for diacetyl at the end of fermentation before you chill the tanks. You can do daily tasting panels to check the product consistency before, during, and after packaging. In parentheses, very important point, make sure you have reliable panel members. It's important to have the same people showing up on a consistent basis just, just to make sure that you have qualified tasters that, that really know the product well. You can do things like off-flavor aroma training to try to determine what uh, any kind of off-flavors that you might have in your product as well. That's pretty easy to do. Product archiving. I always recommend keeping a library of samples from each packaging run. You, uh, by doing that, you can analyze shelf life, so you can keep things, you can see how, uh, try to mimic how they might be behaving on a, on a retailer's shelf. It can also help you diagnose if you have a customer that calls and says, hey, I bought this and had this issue, you can actually go to, you can say to that customer, hey, I'll go pull the sample I have from the library and look at it. And um, it provides a lot of assurance to the customer if they do that. Um, you can store it at multiple temperatures if you want a wider analysis. So you can store some cold uh, if you want kind of the best possible uh, 
prediction of shelf life, but you can also store it really warm and see how well things hold up. Because as we know, uh, on retailers' shelves, a lot of times they're not stored cold. So it's a good idea to get a handle on that. And then finally, just the last couple of slides here. Um, this is that last point that I have on the uh, early slide on communication. If you can designate a person to handle interactions with the customer, you're going to get a lot more consistency in how, how um, your, your brewery interacts with, with uh, the public. So um, that person can handle questions, comments, uh, and complaints, um, but it just provides a, a good level of consistency if you can do that and have one person responding. And then finally, education. If you can train all staff, not just people who have their hands on the beer, but uh, tasting room staff, restaurant staff, sales staff, about uh, shelf life, maybe detecting some off flavors like diacetyl, um, you can really cast a wider net than just the people that are uh, on a daily basis interacting with the beer as well. And it can help, help with your quality, help with your consistency across the board. And that's really it. Do you guys have any more questions? Thanks for listening on a third day of the conference. Yeah. Um, are there any good resources you can recommend for more information with methods? I know AFP has a great list of methods. Yeah, the ASBC is a good source, definitely. Um, you can, you know, there there are some technical things on you know, with MBAA as well. Uh, there's some forums. Uh, you know, th those are certainly the big ones as far as brewing goes. Uh, one one thing that I that that triggered for me that I wanted to mention too is um, it, if even if you don't have the budget to buy some of this high-end equipment like an HPLC or GC. Um, even some of the PCR kind of stuff. Uh, reach out to somebody at your local university, um, especially if you have like a state university that's nearby. Uh, a lot of times you can, just by talking to them or coming over with a six pack or four pack or something, you can get some pretty amazing stuff done just by asking a grad student to, to run, and, you know, run a sample on an HPLC uh, or a GC. And sometimes can even get you can get uh, someone to do a, a research project on some interesting sub you know topic that you want to do. Um, so that's that's another place, that, another avenue uh, to, to definitely don't hesitate to reach out to somebody. Um, you know, if you have questions, somebody in a in a lab, um, they're usually very helpful. Especially if you say you're, you're asking from a brewery standpoint, because everybody loves to loves to think that they're, you know, they're helping a, a, their local brewer out.